Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our podcast as uh, this week we prepare for the great feast of Pentecost, which is the great harvest feast and the celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, the birth of the church, the baptism of the church, uh, the promised comforter and paraclete. So it's a great festival day in our church body and we find ourselves maybe a little bit incongruously in the Gospel of John in the seventh chapter. Uh, it's a very short text, and here we meet our Lord, and he is at the Feast of Booths, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, where he offers um, some words about the coming of the Spirit and uh, speaks of himself as the living water. In some ways, I suppose this fits in very well with John's theme. Uh, baptismal waters run throughout the Gospel of John, and that's uh, no surprise given that John begins his gospel as the gospel of the new creation. So we begin, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now in the person of Christ, God is bringing about a new creation, and the Spirit will once again hover over the face of the waters, bringing light and life uh, back to humanity, and that's what we celebrate at the Feast of Pentecost. Now uh, we begin in this uh, short text by saying, that uh, in this last day, which is the great day of the feast, uh, Jesus stood up. Now, in the Gospel of John, um, there are a number of feasts that are mentioned. And that's mentioned. In that sense, it's a little bit different than the other Gospels in which the Passover is the big one. Um, the evangelist, the fourth evangelist, wants to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament uh, feasts. And this makes sense. The Gospel of John is also very much uh, centered on Jerusalem. I think it was written during a time of persecution in the early church in Jerusalem, and it reflects that. And um, but John wants to show that Jesus in every way is the fulfillment of everything that the Jews had hoped for throughout the many years as they waited for the coming Messiah. Now they're waiting on this great day, which is the Feast of the Booze or the Tabernacles, now that feast in the Old Testament was a feast which commemorated um, the, the sojourning of the uh, Jews during the uh, time in the desert when they uh, wandered for 40 years and lived in temporary um, housing. So it represents Israel on the move. And in a sense, I suppose, this also sets the tone for Pentecost because as we go to the book of Acts, we begin with the temple, which uh, shows that God throughout the ages, uh, since the time of Solomon, dwelled there in Jerusalem in the temple uh, as his dwelling place in the Holy of Holies. But now we see in the book of Acts that our Lord will be taking it on the move or on the road, that the Spirit will blow where he will and that Christ's church will be established in many places throughout the world, wherever Christ's word is preached and wherever his sacraments are administered. So the Feast of the Booze is the, feast, is the Feast of Pilgrimage, and it expresses our Christian life as one of pilgrimage. Uh, so on this great day, the Feast of Booze, Jesus stood up and he cried out. So this is, uh, he's in a sense, I suppose you could say he is a Pentecost preacher. It reminds us a little bit of Peter standing up there in Jerusalem and the boldness that it took for Peter to do that, filled with the Holy Spirit, which he received from Christ, knowing that our Lord had just been put to death by these very same Jewish leaders, yet he stood up and proclaimed his great Pentecost message of repentance, but also forgiveness in Christ Jesus, who had died for their sins. Well, Jesus himself cries out on the Feast of Pentecost, saying that whoever thirsts, uh, let him come unto me, and then let him drink. Now, this is the way John works when it comes to the sacraments. Um, John wants to show that Jesus himself is the very source of these things. That uh, the blood that uh, we receive in the chalice is the very blood that flows from his side. The body that we receive is the body that hangs on the cross. And the water that washes away our sin and then fills us with the Holy Spirit gives us uh, that gives us the drink, gives us the uh, life-giving spirit 
is the spirit that comes from Christ himself. So he cries out, if anybody thirsts, well, we know, we've already seen in John somebody who's thirsted. We've seen the uh, woman at the well, the Samaritan woman who comes to Jesus with a bucket full of water. And uh, after a long conversation with Jesus, uh, she actually leaves the bucket at the well. She doesn't even take the water with her because she has received, she's distracted because now she has received Christ who she understands is the living water, the water that if she drinks of that, she will never thirst again. This is the life-giving water of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is associated with the breath and with the water. And it's instructive because these are the things that make up life so that uh, when we're looking for life on Mars, uh, what do you look for? You look for water. Uh, when you look to see if a person is alive still, you see if they are breathing. Breath and water are the essential components of life. So also the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, is the life-giving water that comes from Christ. It's the breath of life which we receive in the Pentecost uh, by which we confess that Christ is Lord. So he says, let them come unto me. So this is where life is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We come to Christ, and um, in Christ, uh, if we thirst, then we are invited to drink from him. Now, the one who believes in me, uh, Christ says, believe in my Father, believe also in me. Um, to know God is to know Christ, or better yet, to say, to know Christ is to know God, and to believe in Christ is to believe in his Father. Uh, entering into the Trinitarian life of our baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as the scripture says, so John is keen on saying this all over the place, that um, Christ is indeed the fulfillment of the scriptures of the Jewish people of the Old Testament. Well, what will happen then, according to John, is now this is remarkable, is that, um, well, sometimes in the English it's saying out of his heart, but really that's out of his belly, um, uh, rivers will flow. This is like, I mean, it reminds me of the rivers of Genesis, um, the life-giving, teeming waters of Genesis. Uh, reminds me of the river that flows in the book of Revelation, the river of life. But rivers from his belly will flow of living water. Um, this is, the Didache talks about baptizing with living water, the bubbling water. And of course, any baptismal water, whether it's in the font or from a river, it is living water because it's vivified or made alive by the Spirit of Christ and it gives life. Um, even as one who is parched in the desert is restored by water, so also spiritually. This is the water of the Spirit. Will flow from his belly. Now this is, um, you could say this is the Christian, um, but it first happens with the person of Christ because uh, we do know in the, in the Gospel of John, when we get to the 19th chapter in Christ's death, that uh, the soldier pierces our Lord's side, and from that side flows water and blood. That water is the water that fills our fonts. That very same water is the water that flows in the book of Revelation that comes from the land and the trees around it are bare fruit because that is the life-giving and eternal water. So also the Christian... Um, who believes, though, so also he is, in fact, has the Spirit. Um, in the book of Acts, we hear people bubbling with the Spirit, and um, the Spirit makes us alive. It gives us the breath of life by which we confess Christ is Lord. This is the living water uh, that revives us. Now, uh, in John, you get these parenthetical remarks that we are familiar with, and you get one here. So John is saying, now, he said this, in case we didn't know, concerning the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Pentecost. This is Jesus' own prophecy about the day of Pentecost, concern, and, and I suppose also about his death, because it's his death, in his death, that he releases the Spirit. And then the crucified and the risen Lord breathes out that Spirit upon his apostles. And that same spirit then comes upon the church at Pentecost, which is a gathering feast. 
So he said concerning the Spirit, which um, those who believe in him, and you see again, those who believe in him, there's, this is, the Gospel of John was written so that um, we might believe in Christ Jesus our Lord and know him as the Savior, so that those who were um, going to believe him might also therefore uh, receive him um, so, so that, uh, but now at this time yet there was not yet, there was not yet the Spirit. Now this is interesting um, because uh, what does John mean when he says that the Spirit uh, was not yet? Um, well, uh, they were going to receive the Spirit, but the Spirit was not yet. Now, in one sense, we could say, well, that's not true. Because we know that the holy prophets in the Old Testament spoke by the power of the Spirit. Um, in many and various ways, God to, spoke to his people of old by the prophets. This spirit was the spirit that filled Zechariah and Elizabeth in the Gospel of Luke. And yet, um, there's another sense in which the spirit uh, had gone away. The spirit could not reside in sinful man. Now we say as Christians, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, but this is made possible by the coming of Jesus. With the coming of Jesus, now the spirit, um, when God breathed in Genesis into Adam, he became a living soul. He received the spirit of life, but that spirit cannot dwell in sinful man. But now with the coming of Christ, all is forgiven, and creation has begun anew, and the spirit that we receive is in fact the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit that came on him in his baptism, the spirit that we receive in our baptism, the spirit that led him to the cross and the spirit by which he was raised, that's the very same Holy Spirit that we now receive. So what was still waiting, what still needed to happen for that Spirit to come, the Spirit that Jesus received that he would give to the rest of humanity? It says, because Jesus was not yet, this is the great Johannine word again, glorified. And, um, well, we might think glorification, uh, we just celebrated the ascension was a great day of glorification. Our Lord rose up to the highest place, to the right hand of God, where he lives and reigns forever. That's a day of glory. Uh, but more precisely, John th is thinking here of the day of his glorification upon the cross, when our Lord is lifted up high upon that cross, nailed, wounded, wearing the crown of thorns that uh, he bears for us, where he is the king of the Jews. And, um, you know, I, I just love, like, there, there are verses that follow, that right before this text, it's remarkable because Jesus had said to these people at the Feast of Booze, he said, he said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to, to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And the Jews said to one another, what does this man intend to go that, where does he go, intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? That's exactly what he's going to do in the church. He's going to go among the dispersion. This is the story of the book of Acts, uh, where Christ, through his apostles, and then through his deacons and his church, will spread this message of salvation to the Greeks. And it begins in the cross, where, remember, in the cross, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, and it's written not only in the Aramaic or the, the Hebrew, but it's also written in the Greek and the Latin so that the whole world might read and know who Christ is. And that's the message we proclaim on Pentecost, that the Spirit, has, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of creation, has come back to us and made us alive and also is the life-giving breath for the whole world. Well, thank you for uh, spending this time with us, and I, we wish you a very blessed Pentecost.